Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizens-based forum where we look at issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. And I would uh, like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for helping us to make these interviews possible. Before we get started this afternoon, I would like to acknowledge that our interview is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the waters and all that lies above and below. So today, I'm joined by Adele Gamar, who is running for Coquitlam Mayor. So thank you so much, Adele, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Nancy. It's good to be with you. It's um, wonderful to see you, and I'm hoping that maybe we can start just by learning a little bit about who you are, and if you could give us a little bit of background and a sense of why you're running for Coquitlam Mayor. Sure. Thank you again. Um, my parents immigrated to Canada back in 86. Um, they bought a home at Riverview Heights or River Heights. Um, I attended Wrench Park Elementary, uh, played rugby at Charles Best, and graduated from Centennial in 93. I uh, worked at Foot Locker, and then one of my favorite jobs just after high school is that I worked at Chuck E. Cheese, where I was a birthday host. Uh, worked with, and this was my moment of fame, worked with uh, Michael Bublé, who was, believe it or not, dressed as Chucky while I was the one singing Happy Birthday uh, for the children uh, That's during their birthdays. That's a whole other story there. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Michael ended up getting fired, and a lot of things ended up going downhill <laughs> for many of us, and okay. we ended up looking for what are the other opportunities for us. Um, I took a couple of classes at Douglas College, not really sure what it is that I wanted to do, but I had a fire in my belly to make an impact in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a lot to do with the, 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 the foundational raising of my parents. They okay. raised myself and four of my siblings on the values of hard work, give back to the community. And if you see that there's something wrong, that you have a deep moral mm -hmm. responsibility to make a difference. We weren't raised to be pessimists. We were raised to see challenges as opportunities. And I'm grateful for those values, and it's the very values that I try to um, teach uh, and embark on for my children. Um, I ended up moving to Calgary, um, registered uh, for a bachelor's of education, became an elementary school teacher, met the love of my life, Naomi. We started a family. We traveled overseas where I had the privilege to work for the United Nations as education specialist with UNESCO. Okay. And then I really wanted to learn policy and developing leadership skills in people, particularly those that were at high stakes, big decisions, not only at the city level, but also at a national, federal level. And so with for fortunate enough, with a bit of hard work and a lot of luck, I ended up going to Harvard where I studied public policy, began to teach leadership, um, and again, with the lens of how do you build capacity in people to address mm -hmm. complex systemic challenges? where leadership is not seen as positional, but rather an opportunity where you can collaborate with people. And I mean, I know the name of the show here is We Have Issues, <laughs> and I'm driven to see issues and ask what are the opportunities and the opportunities for collaboration to help make progress on those. Um, and so Coquitlam is not the same Coquitlam of my youth. Back then it was the district of Coquitlam. Um, I believe population was about 45,000 people. Okay. Uh, my parents' home still has a sticker on their power uh, box where it says the district of Coquitlam. I think that's like a, a classic picture or a sticker to like hold a on vintage. to. Vintage. That's right. <laughs> um, uh, but now we're approaching 150 people. Right. And so with that growth, of course, we have a lot of challenges. And yes. I'm looking forward to discuss what some of those challenges are. But why am I running is, I know that I have a deep commitment to serve. And again, it's the values of me being raised at a home of immigrants who, my dad being an accountant, my mother being a registered nurse and also a school teacher, that it was ingrained in us from an early age, give back to your community. And if you see that there's a, a challenge, it's an opportunity for you to make some progress on those. Well, it sounds like you come with quite a, a, a diverse range of skills and an interesting background um, with a lot of public service in there already. So you did run uh, for mayor in the last election and you know a lot of things have changed since the, you know during those four years. Can you tell us how the challenges that are facing Coquitlam now differ from the challenges that were facing Coquitlam when you ran the first time around? Sure. 
I mean, of course, last election, we did not have a pandemic. Right. Um, and a pandemic that certainly brought in and of itself a lot of challenges that nobody saw coming. Um, a lot of people, inflation has come around. Uh, we've had a heat dome. Mm -hmm. um, we are dealing with a housing crisis that we've never seen before. And again, of course, with the exponential growth in our population requires us to look at these challenges with a different lens. I think the opportunity here is, is that there isn't a single issue that the city of Coquitlam is facing that right. will only require one out of the box um, remedy. In fact, everything is an integrated. If we're looking at addressing our climate crisis, we cannot do that without taking a look at our um, housing bylaws. Are we building sustainable homes? The biggest emission in our city comes from buildings and automobiles. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw recently the high rise in uh, gas prices, and one of my policy wonk friends was telling me, ask not what your premier can do for gas prices, but ask your mayor, why have we built a car dependent city? Yeah where we're constantly giving a lot of our hard-earned money to fossil fuels to operate a car that gets us from simply point A to point B. And so we can't address the environment without really looking at how are we designing our cities? Is it walkable? But we also can't address mental health without acknowledging the fact that we are um, disconnected from each other. Mm -hmm. The pandemic has raised that. I mean, people were asked to stay home. We're zooming in. Uh, to meetings. We're not engaging or connecting. Right. And so creating it's a big difference for a lot of people and some people that are already isolated, that's just one more layer of isolation that, you know, is put in place there. Yeah. So you know, and I think you've raised so many issues already, but not only have you... <laughs> That's the whole show. Yeah. You've got issues. Well, now, I see that, <laughs> but we see opportunities, so we're yeah. going to get to the opportunities yeah. of them, but certainly there are a lot of issues that... Uh... But I think what you are doing as well, you're raising the issues, but you're also showing the interconnectedness between the issues. Like, So you're saying we can't just take one of the issues and deal with it and solve it. Like, everything is connected. So we have to look at the bigger picture and see how things are put together and, and you know, maybe how we change something, how it affects something else. So um, can we talk about housing for just a little bit? Sure. I know it's connected to everything else, but what do you see for housing? Like, you've already mentioned we have an affordability crisis. How can the municipality um, you know, in your role as mayor, how can you start to address that? That's great, yeah. First of all, fresh perspective, to see a challenge as an opportunity for collaboration and thinking anew. A lot of people think that mayor and council's role is to provide critical services. And I might be going off on a limb by saying this, that that is the job of management right. of the city. Uh, picking up garbage, making sure the streets are um, you know, fixed when necessary. Mm -hmm. These are the operational day-to-day. So the day-to-day -day. Day operational. That's right. right. I believe mayor and council are problem solvers, and historically it's always been the case. Okay. Our job um, is to look at these challenges and say, from our vantage point and the strategic lens, who do we need to be bringing in the room? Mm -hmm. Not only from private sector, but certainly public sector. Um, you know, I believe as mayor, the job is not to be just seen in the community at public events, right. but the mayor needs to be just as much in Ottawa advocating for the needs of our city as much as they need to be in Victoria. The ambassador of the city is the mayor. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem solver and the, the big eyes, you know, looking at the systemic challenges ought to be mayor along, obviously, collaboratively with council. Um, and so when we're looking at the housing affordability, um, I mean, we can talk economics 101, the supply-demand right. issue, but I right. think that that's really pretty clear that we need more supply. But what type of supply? Mm -hmm. The idea of housing as a single-family home, that is A, far-reached from people, they cannot access it, and B, frankly, the, the next generation and even the seniors or, or people who are aging with dil, uh, uh, dignity in this city are not necessarily looking for a single-family home. Right. In Coquitlam, we haven't built enough rental. In various European cities, that is the go-to option is to rent because then you have a lot more savings that you can use to be able to go on your annual holidays and vacations. Uh, and so Coquillum, I believe we have a great opportunity to increase our rental stock okay. to give people an opportunity to save some money while at the same time live and hopefully retire in the city. That's obviously a beautiful city, but it's just far reaching now. Um, I was on the phone a couple of months ago with the mayor of Saanich, and I've explored opportunities of what are other cities doing right. to think innovatively of how to address this housing crisis. Now, 
uh, Mayor of Saanich, along with council, approved this concept that I think is quite beautiful and it's worth exploring in Coquitlam. It's what they called the garden suite. Now, you can see where the connection comes in when we have a project like this garden suite. We have an aging population in Coquitlam that does not want another option. They want to stay and right, retire and in the home. age in place. That's right. Yeah. So if they want to age in place, recognizing the house that they raised their kids in mm -hmm. is still three floors. Right. Going up and down the stairs is pretty hard. I've talked to a lot of seniors across the city and they said, Adele, as mayor, could you bring more ranchers? Now, ranch homes uh, are one floor. Right. Take up a lot of land space. Right. What the city of Saanich has done is recognizing this need for seniors to age in place while at the same time wanting to maybe keep the house for their kids. They've allowed uh, what they call the garden suite, which is a one floor up to, I believe, 800, 1,000 square feet in the backyard. Instead of saying a basement suite that's rented, they can then build something in their backyard. They don't need a lane. They just basically need a walkway as they would for the basement okay. suite. They get to retire in place. The condition is that they would either rent the main house or rent the garden suite, but they are as the homeowners right, there. Right, so they stay on the residence and then they're like sharing, but sharing cost and also maybe getting a little more connectedness too because there will be those interactions which feeds into mental health and mental wellness as well. So, right. Um, so I it's an innovative idea. It's yeah. not one that necessarily will be done across the city. but no, one size fits all, but it's... It's a creative a idea option. of addressing yeah. seniors retiring in place while at the same time addressing the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. No, interesting. And I think we do have to look at innovative options and, and new ideas, new perspectives. Um, you had also mentioned about how you felt it was important for the mayor to reach out to um, other elected officials like on the provincial and federal federal scale. So is there a role that they can play to help make this happen, to support the municipality in um, making sure that everybody has a home in, in Coquitlam? Absolutely. Um, I've reached out to various MPs, two that represent the Tri-Cities. As a candidate, I asked, how often do you meet with the current mayor and, and do you have a standing meeting? Yeah. And the response was, we meet at public events. And okay. to me, that's not a strategic meeting. That's just you're bumping into each other, maybe taking a picture, and you know, you're informing your constituents that you're in the community. Uh, I believe that there needs to be regular meetings whereby, again, back to the collaborative, adapt, you know, building leadership capacity in people, the members of parliament have the federal lens. Right. Uh, they, if they are in government, they have the federal funding and support and initiatives. The mayor being the biggest ambassador and voice for the city ought to then be raising those issues and finding these opportunities for collaboration. Uh, and I'll give you one primary example. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Christia Freeland was here months ago to announce the initiative around child care. Right. And of course, we know that that's close and dear to many people in Coquitlam because we have a lot of young families that choose Coquitlam to be home, uh, to their home. So one thing that she mentioned to me is that we need to be doing more for Coquitlam. Coquitlam is one of the fastest growing cities with young families, mm -hmm. and we need this initiative. The provincial government uh, reached out and asked the city to utilize some space at this new um, community center in Place Maillardville. And they were asking for 20 to 25 spots for children to have allocated for childcare. Right. All they needed was the space. They will fund the development of it and perhaps even find the operation, somebody to operate it. Provincial government recognizing there's a need locally, mm -hmm. um, and the city unfortunately did not seize on that opportunity and said, we're just gonna open it for all ages, we're not gonna dedicate some child care space. Now if you visit Millardville, there's a lot of young families that are moving there. Right. Hard working families, mm -hmm. um, medium income, uh, you know, or, or uh, you know, hard working families that would need some child care uh, mm -hmm. accessibility. Right now, on average, if you go to any child care center, you're about 500 person wait list, three and a half year wait list. So before even conceiving a child, you ought to be thinking about getting on that list. It's a lot to think about, like even Right, before. beyond just how do you yes. have a baby and, and, and yes. when you have a baby and all the other responsibilities that come with it. So I think there are lots of opportunities. There isn't one size that fits all, but you need a fresh perspective and mm -hmm. leadership that says the status quo is never enough. We always have an opportunity to become not only just a good city, but a better city, and it does require a lot of collaboration. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit? You're talking about collaboration with different levels of government with respect to housing and child care. Um, would that also extend to public amenities? 
um, and public spaces and you know to even broaden it further do we have enough public spaces yeah I think we can certainly do a lot better um, I mean, I'm a big advocate for libraries as a public space, not only for a place that you get books. And I understand a lot of people who come from an old mindset that is library is a place where you just get books and sign them out. We've seen it more than ever before, the importance of libraries yeah. as public infrastructure that provides washrooms, public washrooms. I'm a transit user, and yeah. so we know TransLake does not have public washrooms. And I see a lot of people who just get off Lincoln Station just to use the bathroom in, in the public library and then continue on. Um, they also provide cooling yes. places, especially Becoming with increasingly the, important. Absolutely. Yeah. So a cooling place, a place to use internet. We take this mm. for granted. A lot of families in Coquitlam still cannot afford uh, internet. Yes. And so they go there to look for jobs. Uh, story time for young people, an opportunity for immigrants to meet with people from their community. I mean, that is an untapped resource. And in a growing community city like Coquitlam, 150,000, we have two branches. The town center branch was an afterthought. It was never built with the strategic foresight that it will be a library. It just happened to be a parking space, a storage space that then was converted into a library. So we need to be thinking future. We need to be thinking, what are the critical services now, but also as we continue to grow exponentially, how do we make sure that families are served well? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that people are getting more connected with each other as we desperately need it emerging out of the well, pandemic? And I think just, you know, to stay with the library for a second, I think it's one of the very few no barrier um, public spaces where everybody can feel welcome. Right. You can go in, you can charge your cell phone or you can use the computer, the washroom. Um, and one place where I found that it was super important was when we recently had Syrian refugees come over. Right. A lot of them went there for support and a, a place to meet. And it really was um, they are spaces that bring the community together. Yeah. So libraries, yes, I think more libraries. And we do underestimate the, the services that they provide for people, I think. They do. And Nancy, you know, I can keep talking about libraries and public spaces, but our budget, we are one of, our libraries is one of the least funded across mm -hmm. Canada. And um, having lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, they've got a population of about 90,000, a lot less than us, but yet they still have approximately 11 branches. Right. And by 11 branches, it's not your big branch like city center or Poye. They have neighborhood branches. So imagine if you may, you're walking down Millardville because we talked about it a little bit earlier, and there is a single house that has been mm -hmm. purchased by the city and converted into a library. You can go there and drop off books, enter library loans, just have a little cute coffee shop there where people in the neighborhood don't have to rely on their cars to go to and right. from. They can just walk down the street, very accessible. And we've heard this. I mean, my daughter's in the studio. We heard this from neighbors in Millardville saying, we need more libraries and just nothing big, nothing right. expensive, but a place where we can just hang out and meet. So Adele, how do we get more libraries? I think you need leadership that acknowledges that libraries are not just places for books. Mm -hmm. And that could go with public uh, parks, that it's not just a place to take your skateboard or bounce a basketball. Mm -hmm. It is a place of opportunity where people can get connected and feel a deep sense of belonging, Nancy. Right. I mean, they're called public spaces because they're public good. And as long as the city continues to tax people and, 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 and get their hard-earned hard dollars, they need to be thinking strategically on how do we better serve so people are well taken care of. We can't isolate mental health and say we need more help and get a hotline, which is critical as a last resort, as a technical immediate response mm -hmm. in a state of an emergency. But what else ought we be doing so that we're not at that critical point where people need mental support? How do we depend on each other and how do we provide these critical services for a sense of community? And I think um, when you're talking about connectedness and, and isolation and things, public spaces are incredibly important. Are there other types of public spaces that you think that we should be seeing? In absolutely, COVID absolutely. There's lots of research and I don't know if I shared this, but I'm a, a proud dad of five and they're all wonderful, smart, driven young women. And I five I, girls. Five girls. <laughs> You're lucky. And I am and blessed and just so fortunate. <laughs> I mean, they're a force to be reckoned with, let me <laughs> tell you. Um, but one thing that I have been honored to learn through the process of being a father, and particularly a father of girls, is, is that our cities are not designed for everyone. 
All right. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Next time you go to a park that has a basketball court, just take a look at what gender is fairly represented on those mm -hmm. basketball courts. We have skate parks. Take a look at how and how many people are there and what is the gender representation. There's research out there that has proven that cities are not designed for everyone, and particularly um, acknowledging boys versus girls. Um, and so what do we do instead? Again, there's more research that says for young women and girls, they want places that are well lit right. and safe, and they love swings. Oh, I mean, is that who, right? Who doesn't okay. like swings? I... <laughs> but they love swings, and they love swings that are facing each other, especially if they're lit. And so the city of Boston took this initiative where they actually have a space. So there's actually a study done on this. There's lots of research. I mean, there's books have been written about how our data has been really um, 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 uh, geared towards men and young boys as opposed to developing cities that is gender inclusive. Interesting. The argument that's being made is that if you do build a city that is gender inclusive right. with a female lens, it becomes by default inclusive for all. Right. Okay. Young women, I mean, young women uh, find it um, very inhibiting to be able to go to swings because they've been designed for young children and naturally young families right. with their young kids will right. say, you teenagers, you know. Get off the swings. That's right. And they're yeah. like, well, we just want to hang out and talk. Right. If it's not swings, it's benches. So benches that face each other, mm -hmm. where people can just hang out, sit, I mean, bring a pot of tea or coffee and just hang out in these right. public spaces. And we've seen that with energy of people being in these public spaces, more and more folks come out. Now I have to acknowledge the city of Quillam has done a really good job by putting in um, various table tennis uh, uh, across the city. One is in Pat Buchanan uh, Square, the other is at Lafarge. And so these are opportunities for people to come out, and I think we can increase those uh, as, uh, as we grow in population, but also the demand. Right, now, okay, so now that we're talking about public spaces, I'm gonna bring up one of my own passions. Yeah. And it's for green spaces, for natural areas, for trees. Yes. Um, <laughs> we've seen a lot of trees come down. We've also seen a lot of good work, I think, on um, behalf of the Parks Department being carried on right now in Coquitlam. Yeah. There's a strategy out there trying to plant 10,000 trees by the end of the year. So I think public awareness is really raised about the importance of trees and especially big trees in our city. So what are your thoughts on that? Are big trees important? How do we keep them? How do we find that balance? Absolutely. So are big trees important? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need to be preserving our trees? Absolutely. Uh, do we need to be planting more trees? Yes. But Nancy, as I've indicated, and I think you're probably seeing there's a, there's a, 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 a thread here or a trend mm -hmm. in that any given challenge, there are opportunities for various levels of collaboration. Uh, these trees have been here, especially the older trees, for hundreds of years. And uh, one thing that I'm really inspired about is um, bringing city uh, or nation to government relationships when we're talking about reconciliation. Right. I had a conversation with Chief Ed Hall about this and that wouldn't it be amazing, in fact, the right thing to do is that when we are being presented with a development proposal that we hear the wisdom of the elders, mm -hmm. that we hear Chief Ed Hall and the interest of the Coquitlam First Nations. That's After absolutely. all, you yes. opened up by recognizing that we're yes. on the unceded territory of Coquitlam or unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. And so he said to me, Adele, we've never had a conversation like mm -hmm. that of an elected official that actually comes forward and says, we need the wisdom of the elders. We need your perspective. I mean, you and I are talking as settlers. Well, what do we think about trees? Right. I think they're great. Of course, they right. suck in carbon and they give us some good O2. We need more of it. Absolutely. But who's missing from that conversation? Absolutely. And uh, that's a, a conversation that you're right. I don't think we've ever had that conversation. Yeah. So to be inclusive of our First Nation, the First Nation here, um, Coquitlam First Nation, and of everybody in the community. So um, we just had a reconciliation um, Indigenous-led event this weekend, which we're starting some of those conversations, but they're missing. Yeah. Um, they have been missing from our community for for a long time. Um, I mean, I'll be, I'll be op open and honest with you about this. Back in February, I reached out to Chief Ed Hall and the two councillors, and we mm -hmm. met at their council chamber, and I said right. to them, I see the need of my city as I've grown up and the challenges that are in the city, but um, I'm considering running, but I will not run without your support and blessings. And right. I said to them, I've never done this before. I have no idea if there's even protocol. Right. And they all looked at each other and said, we, we don't even have protocol because nobody's ever approached it's us new, in this way. new area, right? 
So I don't see as Adele Gamar running for mayor because he wants to occupy a seat at City Hall. Mm -hmm. And I know how that's oftentimes how people present it. You know, you're running for the seat of. Right. You're looking to unseat. You're looking for a seat. I'm certainly not trying to keep, you know, my behind warm on any seat. But rather I see there are a lot of complex challenges and it requires new thinking and new leadership. Like anything, change is, is, is a requirement. We have the seasons changing. We have executives that generally, you know, spend eight years in a role mm -hmm. before they run out of ideas and steam. I want to infuse hope in the city. Okay. I want to bring various levels of government because they recognize the opportunity that we have here uh, in the city as we grow and address these complex challenges. Will I have all the answers? No, I'm driven to make sure that we address these challenges, but we certainly need collaboration and, and, uh, and support. Well, you've brought some really new perspectives, so I, I thank you for that. Um, I do have one more question okay. that I want to cover before we wrap up, and it's something that we always talk about on our interviews, and it's respectful workplace. So just um, if we could have just a conversation about what your thoughts are on, on what a respectful workplace is and how you would, as mayor, um, promote a respectful workplace where everybody's voice could be heard. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I mean, we're looking at addressing these challenges and it's important to bring as many voices to the table and perspectives, but also lived experience. And of course, you know, it doesn't, um, uh, we can't, it's pretty obvious that I don't fit the general uh, uh, resume of a, of a mayor in a city like this. Um, I, I think if elected, this would be, uh, 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 we've never had somebody who is black, indigenous, or a person of color in a position. Mm -hmm. And so I understand and appreciate the challenges of making sure that we have people's voices that are heard. Right. Um, in my leadership training and also my consultancy, it is always important in front and center that we ensure that people's voices are heard. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking to address these challenges, how do you surface the concerns and perspectives without making sure that everybody feels safe? Right. And so one thing that's important to me is making sure we have what we call the holding environment or psychological safety a place where people can stick their neck out and not risk retribution. A safe space. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that starts with the top. I mean, the mayor, like executive, like any president of an organization, sets the tone. So it has to start from them. And a healthy conversations that people are able to give uh, a different opinion, and it's welcomed. In fact, not just nodded and saying thank you very much, but rather taken seriously and into consideration. Acknowledged and considered. Absolutely. Okay. That's wonderful, um, the thoughts that you have on that. I really appreciate it. I just have one really quick question. Okay. and this which is, means you need a quick answer from me. I need a quick ah. answer. How do we get more people out to vote? We get about 26% of people voting in municipal elections. Yeah. How are we going to get them out there Get to them vote? engaged. Knock on doors. Okay. Meet where people are. I mean, Amina and I, who's been, you know, championing this, she's my greatest volunteer. She's been hanging out with me all summer long. She's in the <laughs> studio today. Uh, and what we're hearing, and Amina could attest to this, <laughs> is, is that people are saying we're finally seeing ourselves in a campaign. Right. We have a lot of first-time voters that said no, and first-time voters that are 25, 30 years old, some are even 45 years old who've never voted locally. Right. And so the campaign that we're hoping is that not only are we looking to build a city for everyone, we want this campaign for everyone. And so we're encouraging people. I keep getting hope and inspired by uh, the perspective and the insight that people are having. But it's not a matter of just waiting for people to show up. We have to reach out to them. And, and what a beautiful way to do this than a local campaign is this. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adele, for joining us today. Um, I feel like we got to know a lot about you and a lot of the vision that you have for Coquitlam. So thank you very thank much you. for joining us on We've Got Issues. And we were speaking today with Adele Gamar, who is running for mayor of Coquitlam. Thank you.